Hello friends, and welcome to Volume 5 of Obscure and Forgotten PS1 Games, the fifth installment in the ongoing series dedicated to shining a spotlight on some of the PlayStation's lesser known titles. If you're looking to discover some new hidden gems, or have just run out of games to add to your PS1 Classic, well, you've come to the right place. As always, in today's episode, we're going to take our curated list of PlayStation games, randomize them down to a top 100, and then add them all into a big spinning prize wheel. We're going to spin the wheel three times, and whatever the wheel lands on will be our topic for today's episode. Good games, bad games, budget titles, it doesn't matter. Anything is fair game, and believe me, we are still only scratching the surface of this console library, so we better stop wasting time and get right into this. It's time to play some games, and my friends, only the wheel can provide. Volume 5's first game is Incredible Crisis, first making its way onto Japanese shelves in 1999 before eventually making its way to the West in the year 2000. Incredible Crisis is the brainchild of Japanese developer Polygon Magic. They made a few games for the PS1 including the psychic survival horror title Galarians and the cool Japan-only cel-shaded fighting game Slap Happy Rhythm Busters, which yes, is really cool and you should try it. Probably the most celebrated of all Polygon Magic's games though is Incredible Crisis, a single-player minigame collection that's based around the incredibly strange scenarios that a Japanese family experiences over the course of a single day. It is also full of ska music. So first things first, Incredible Crisis is a very, very Japanese game, and I mean this in the best possible way. It's a celebration of the strange and surreal, and it's the kind of thing that can only possibly exist as a video game. In a lot of ways, I'm surprised it even made its way over to the West, but thanks to Titus the Fox, of all things, it somehow did. So, thanks Titus, this is probably the best thing you've ever done for video games. Doesn't make up for Superman 64 and Robocop, but it helps. So, as mentioned before, Incredible Crisis is a single-player minigame collection. The game starts in the living room of a Japanese family early in the morning. The grandmother of the house declares it's her birthday, but of course every single member of the family has forgotten, and she requests that everybody better be home early today to celebrate her special birthday. What follows from here is a single day viewed through the eyes of each of the other four family members. The father, the mother, the son, and the Holy Ghost. I mean, the daughter. Sorry, force of habit. And I don't think it's a stretch to say that some insane things happen throughout the course of this day. You've got dancing, shopping, alien invasions, throwing water out of a boat with a bucket, a giant teddy bear, an armed gang, giant bugs. There is quite literally no way of knowing where this game is going to go next, and really that's the fun of it. You'll play as the four family members one by one, each experiencing the day from their own point of view. So in the beginning you'll start as the father who begins his day at work, and then soon after working out to some company mandated morning exercise, a ball crashes through the wall and proceeds to chase you around the office. And once you've outrun that and made it into the elevator, you've now got to stop the elevator from dropping you very quickly to your death. And of course from there, due to some more misfortune, you're now carefully trying to make your way back into the building, using a flagpole that seems to be having a hard time, uh, being attached to it. This is basically the flow of Incredible Crisis. You watch as your character goes from one insane situation to the next, in a series of fun CGI cutscenes, and every now and then you'll play a minigame in between, so they don't die and you can keep moving forward. The minigames themselves are quite simple. You'll see a lot of familiar game types making appearances like rhythm games, brain games, memory games, slide games, turret sections. If I'm being honest, the actual selection of minigames on offer really aren't all that exciting or groundbreaking, at least from a gameplay perspective. But it's the way that they're presented with such charm and personality. This is how the game wins you over. 
There are times in Incredible Crisis where I am having a lot of fun. There are also times where I am perplexed and even times where I am pretty frustrated. But there was never a point where I was bored playing this game. You always want to see what's going to happen next and how the different characters' days cross over and affect one another. It just never stops getting weirder and weirder. Just a tiny bit down there. Look, I said it was weird. The game itself is broken up into individual chapters, usually three for each of the four characters, and during these chapters you'll play usually two or three minigames. At the end of each chapter, you'll also be rewarded a rank for your performance in the minigames, and depending on how well you do, you might be rewarded a few extra lives in the process. If you fail a minigame in Incredible Crisis, which you likely will a few times, you'll lose a life, and if you lose all of your lives, it's game over. Thankfully, the game does let you save in between every chapter, so as long as you have a memory card, you'll never be at risk of losing too much progress. But having a few extra lives to hand really does come in handy for some of the game's trickier minigames. There are around 24 minigames total in Incredible Crisis, and while there are plenty of unique minigames, towards the end of the game, you will begin to see a little repetition in the game types. In particular, this Titanic minigame where you have to throw water out of a boat using a bucket, you gotta play this one game three times throughout the entire game, and the game is fully aware of how much you do not want to see this game again. Some of the games are also pretty tricky too. Don't be surprised if you drop a few lives in the process while learning some of these things, and I hope you're proficient at button bashing because some of these minigames will really put your abilities to the test. The last minigame in particular, where you have to ride a bike while avoiding cannons and a wrecking ball, requires some crazy dexterity. You need to alternate tapping the X and triangle buttons while avoiding obstacles, and while this may sound easy, I could barely go 30 seconds without my hands cramping up, and I genuinely thought I was never going to make it past this section until I learned to quickly swap between my fingers and thumb every 10 or so seconds to give each of them a break. It was pretty crazy, but hey, we did it. Overall, I'd say the minigames are fun, but really, it's the characters and the situations that will keep you sticking around to the end in this one. It certainly helps that the game itself looks great too. The character models are detailed and expressive, the animation work is top-notch, and the environments are also clean and colourful, and all the minigames run at a nice stable 30 frames per second. As for the CGI, well, it all looks great too, probably some of the nicest I've seen on the PS1, and it makes a lot of sense considering how integral it is to the game. On the visual front, there's really very little to fault here, it's excellent all round. And of course, we can't finish up without talking about the game's music, because not only is Incredible Crisis weird enough as it is, the game is also kind of a love letter to Ska. The game's entire soundtrack is composed by probably Japan's most influential and legendary ska group, the Tokyo Ska Paradise Orchestra. And look, ska to me is just the most joyful music. You know the legendary description of ska? It's the music that plays in a 13 year old's head when they get extra mozzarella sticks? That's it. That's the feeling of pure joy. The menu music, the mini games, the sound effects, everything here is ska infused. And if you love a bit of two tone in your video games, you are going to have an amazing time with this one. And if you hate Ska, well, I'm sorry, you might be clinically considered dead inside, but don't worry, the Tokyo Ska Paradise Orchestra make sure to mix up the genres a little bit here and there, so there is a nice bit of variety to the soundtrack, all infused with that little bit of extra kick that only a multi-person Ska band can offer. Overall, I found Incredible Crisis to be a wonderful experience. How wonderful a game it may be, well, that's another story. The minigames are fun, but they really lack any replayability. A short while later, WarioWare will come out and really show you how to make a fun single player minigame collection. And while this game has its moments for people who like playing short minigames, well, WarioWare, this is not. And in terms of longevity, well, Incredible Crisis is short very short. The whole thing will take you only a little over an hour to complete, and even though you can go back and play any mini games you've unlocked, it really does feel like a one and done kind of experience. But in spite of that, I still think this is a game every PlayStation owner should play through at least once. It is one of the craziest games on the console, there is very little else out there like it, and at the end of the day, it's just a game designed to make you feel good, and that it will. Nowadays it rarely goes for any more than 20 quid, at least in PAL regions anyway, and for that price I think it is worth taking the leap. Far from a perfect game, but Incredible Crisis is one that no PlayStation fan should miss out on. We
Steel will provide. Up next we have Blast Radius, first released in PAL regions in the summer of 1998 before making its way over to North America in early 1999. Blast Radius was both published and developed by Psygnosis, you know that studio responsible for I don't know like 50% of the PS1's games? Don't quote me on that number but I think it's close enough. Well with Blast Radius we have ourselves a space combat sim and it's pretty much impossible to talk about this game without first bringing up another series called Colony Wars. The Colony Wars series of games were also created by Psygnosis and to this day are probably still considered the best space combat sims on the console. There's three in total but my favourite is still the first game in the series, the 1997 original Colony Wars. This two disc epic features engaging combat scenarios with varied objectives, an interesting story with high quality cutscenes, a fantastic soundtrack and some of the best graphics seen on the PS1 at the time. It also has this great branching path system where failing a mission won't always end your game but will instead send you on a completely different story path, making your performance in each mission feel like it mattered. It was really cool. A sequel to Colony Wars soon followed up in late 1998 called Colony Wars Vengeance but a few months before that, well in Europe anyway, Psygnosis also released a game called Blast Radius, which to the untrained eye looks very much like Colony Wars. I mean, you see Psygnosis, you see space, and you see the words Colony Wars on the game's box, well your mind's gonna wander to Colony Wars. Now while Blast Radius was published and developed by Psygnosis, this game is actually the debut release of a new studio within Psygnosis, Studio Camden. These guys would later go on to develop Kingsley's Adventure and also a game called Team Buddies which I always remember because anytime I see it pop up on eBay it's always going for an insanely high price. So I guess it's probably very good. So while we do have a new development team at the helm, this game is as far as I know built on the same engine used for Colony Wars. So if you're familiar with any of those games, you'll feel right at home here within a few seconds. So what actually sets Blast Radius apart from a Colony Wars game other than the name? Well Blast Radius aims to offer up a more arcade style take on the Colony Wars games. The story driven high stakes battles of the Colony Wars series have been distilled down to their purest form, shooting lasers at bad guys for points so you can reach the high score in space. Also there's lots of techno now. Blast Radius pretty much drops all the story stuff in favour of offering a quicker, more to the point space combat game. Here the game's 40 missions are broken up into individual chapters with 4 missions each. The only story you will see here are the short mission briefings before you enter into a level, but these really serve as nothing more than a quick intro to your objectives for the next mission and are honestly just skippable. The missions themselves are still objective based similar to Colony Wars, sometimes you'll need to protect some allies from damage, sometimes you'll need to destroy an enemy structure, but most of the time the missions usually require you to just kill a select few enemy ships all while blowing up as many fodder enemies as you can to rack up big points as well. These points aren't just for show either because as you progress through the various chapters you can use these points to cash in and buy upgrades for your ship as well, buffing your shields and lasers or maybe even just cash in and get that homing launcher. Go on, you deserve it. As for the ships themselves, well at the beginning you have the choice of 4 ships, each with their own unique stats. When you pick a ship you are pretty much locked into using that ship for a little while at least, you can't swap or change in between missions so do make sure that you pick one that you like. Something cool though is that when you reach chapter 5 in a particular ship that will then get replaced with an upgraded version which you will then use to play the remaining chapters of the game with. This happens for all four of the ships by the way, so there's some definite replayability here if you want to unlock all of these different ships, but do be warned you will be playing some of the exact same missions over and over again a few times, and when your ship does upgrade it also loses some of the new weapons and items that you bought for it as well. So chapter 5 in particular when you just get your ship can be pretty brutal while you're just working your way back up to full power. 
The ships themselves all control wonderfully. I'd say the gameplay on the whole is a little faster and looser than Colony Wars. You've less movement options overall, but the enemy AI in this game seems to be a little bit more basic to match the arcade style here. So you'll rarely find you'll need to do any hectic maneuvers and dogfights to secure kills. Usually just following behind them is all you need. The game features two third person views and a first person view, although the game is unfortunately lacking a cockpit view which is my preferred viewpoint from the Colony Wars games, but the first person and third person options on offer here, they both work very well all the same. Really when it comes to the actual combat itself, there is very little to fault here. If you like space combat and big open arenas with lasers flying everywhere, well here it's as good as it's ever been. Although it is very difficult for me to shake the feeling that Blast Radius isn't just Colony Wars light so to speak. It's still a fun and challenging game with great combat, but comparatively the number of weapons on offer, the objective types, the visual variety, it all just feels a little bit lacking compared to Colony Wars. There's definitely joy to the simplicity of Blast Radius, but I think the grander scale and higher stakes of the Colony Wars games really give them that extra edge and help elevate them to the top of the pile when it comes to this genre on the PS1. After some longer play sessions with Blast Radius, you really begin to see the variety of missions become a bit stale. That being said, it is probably a better pick up and play game because of this suiting shorter play sessions. Although this is where the difficulty comes into play because in the middle of a chapter, if you fail a mission, you can get a game over and the game only lets you save at select missions. So you sometimes need to defeat multiple difficult missions in a row before you even get a chance to save. And this is a game where flying a little too close to an exploding enemy can pretty much one shot your ship. So even if this game is a little bit more forgiving in some aspects, it is still one hell of a challenge and you might see yourself getting stuck for a while at some very frustrating sections. Visually the game maintains all the good qualities of the Colony Wars series with detailed models and great looking backgrounds. The particle and lighting effects are as cool as ever and I've always especially been a fan of the star shooting by you to help bolster that sense of speed. I did feel there wasn't as much visual variety to the combat arenas in Blast Radius but really it's just a minor nitpick. The UI is nice too, it can be confusing at first with the four bars just above the center representing things like fuel and speed, but once you know what everything is, it gives you all the info you need to know without cluttering up too much of the screen. The map and on-screen targeting arrows are also really good at helping you find any enemies within the mission. Performance is pretty good too, it mostly hits a rock solid 30 frames with only a few small dips here and there. I do also love this shiny orb thing in the main menu that runs at a slick 60 frames per second. I'm not gonna lie, this still looks pretty impressive to me. The music and sound is a big highlight here, though that is to be expected from a Psygnosis game. The weapon and ship sound effects are great, and the music offers up a nice selection of electronic and guitar driven tracks, which are very much at odds with Colony Wars more cinematic orchestral offerings, but it absolutely suits Blast Radius more fast paced gameplay, and it really helps give it an identity all of its own. At the end of the day, Blast Radius is yet another great Psygnosis space combat game. I hate having to compare it to Colony Wars so often, but they are really so closely linked it's almost impossible not to. I don't think Blast Radius really matches the depth of the Colony Wars games, but it doesn't really have to. Blast Radius stands on its own as a great arcade style space combat game and probably serves as a better introduction to the genre on the PlayStation than the Colony Wars games thanks to the somewhat more simplified gameplay. I think when you boil it down to the overall quality of the missions, Blast Radius does unfortunately come out a little below in that regard, but it's still a fun, fast and frantic game with stellar visuals and a great soundtrack. If you're a fan of the Colony Wars series and Blast Radius flew under your radar, well then this one is a must try and if you've always wanted to dip your toes into the space combat genre on the PS1, well there are a few better games to start with than this one. will provide
last game this episode is Burst Trick Wakeboarding, which first released in Japan in the year 2000, before eventually making its way to the West in early 2001. As the name would imply, Burst Trick Wakeboarding is a wakeboarding game. Can't say I've played too many of these in my lifetime, and by many I mean exactly zero. But there is quite the handful of wakeboarding games out there, so there is a lot of choice for fans of the sports when it comes to video games. On the other hand, Burst Trick is the PS1's only wakeboarding game so it's carrying the hopes of the whole fandom on its shoulders here. The game was developed by Metro Corporation, who have a pretty interesting catalogue of games under their name, the most famous of which is probably the much-loved Buster Groove series on the PS1. They also developed Britney's Dance Beat, which I now suddenly have a strong urge to play after learning this info. So, given the developer's history, you might expect something unorthodox when it comes to their take on a wakeboarding game, of all things, and you'd be right. Burst Trick isn't really a sports simulator, it's actually more of a straight up arcade title, harkening back to something you might have seen from the likes of Sega in the early 90s. And while that might be disappointing the fans looking for a more true to life representation of wakeboarding, for somebody like myself who's a big fan of old school arcade games with bright colours and simple gameplay, well I gotta say my expectations for this game changed quite rapidly upon starting it up. So Burst Trick itself is split into two different game modes called Obstacle and Trick. These modes each offer a unique gameplay experience, but with that being said, I'm just gonna get it out of the way now. Trick mode sucks. It's trash. The vast majority of the gameplay in this mode is based around moving from side to side and then entering a series of button inputs and then timing a final button press, and that's the whole thing. There are three total stages in this game mode and they are all the exact same and just not that fun at all. I played through it once, it took about 10 minutes, and I'm very very happy not to play through it again. So that just leaves us with obstacle mode, which is thankfully where the real meat of the game lies. In this mode your goal is to earn a target quota of points across 3 laps of a course. The way you earn points in this game is quite simple, you can collect rings that are placed across the track, or you can hit ramps that allow you to perform different tricks for points. Of course while doing this you will also have to navigate around the track's various obstacles and hazards, so you don't bail into the ocean. Actually, hitting a hazard has no penalty, but it does slow you down, which is a big no-no when you're also dealing with a clock that's counting down in the background. And if the clock reaches zero, then you'll have to use one of your limited BT tokens to retry the stage. Run out of these tokens though, and you'll have to start over from the very first track. You can usually hit a few hazards per lap without it causing you too much trouble, but finishing a stage with some extra time on the clock also helps add to your total score, so it's worth trying to be that little bit extra careful on the track, which I rarely was. Thankfully the game's controls are decent enough, it is a very simple game to pick up and play. You use the d-pad to move left and right and you tap the x button to jump. You can also increase the acceleration of the boat that's pulling you along by pressing the L1 button. And honestly that's about all there is to it. The tricks that you pull off during the obstacle mode are actually all automatic. Whenever you go over one of the many ramps littered about each course you will pull off a trick and net some points. Which trick you perform and how many points you earn however are actually defined by the type of ramp that you hit. Hit a big green ramp for a low scoring trick, hit a medium blue ramp for an average scoring trick, and hit a small red ramp for a high scoring trick. The only skill involved in this is actually just hitting the ramp itself. Once you make it over, you get a little cinematic animation, and the points are yours. So yeah, when I said this was a pretty simple arcade game, I really wasn't messing. It is more or less a wakeboard auto-scroller. Move through the six levels, pull off some cool tricks, dodge some obstacles, hit B to light speed dash and collect all the rings and get the highest score you can. It's simple and it's rather shallow, but I would be lying if I said I didn't find it fun. Now, regardless of whether I found the gameplay fun or not, we gotta talk about a big issue that I'm sure you might have noticed by now. This game's performance is not good. Arcade titles are known for their buttery smooth gameplay, now of course not every home port of an arcade title features stellar performance, but when you've got a game with beautiful visuals and a great sense of speed, a decent frame rate is gonna do you wonders. Burst Trick Wakeboarding is a game that really could have benefited from having at minimum a nice stable 30 frames per second. If this game could have possibly hit 60 frames per second, then we'd really be hitting its full potential. 
But what we got is a widely inconsistent frame rate, fluctuating somewhere between 15 and 20 frames per second. And it just makes the game look and feel so choppy to play. It doesn't completely ruin the gameplay, but it is at the level where I would call it distractingly bad. And it also kind of hurts the visuals on offer too, which if I'm being honest, I actually quite like. I don't think they're up to the standards of some other PS1 games released in the 2000s, but these are honestly some of the most colourful graphics I've seen on the PS1, and I think they are a great match for the game's arcade style. It honestly looks like something Sega could have put out in the mid-90s. There are not that many tracks in the game, but only 6 in obstacle mode and 3 in trick mode, but what's here is nice, and there is enough visual differences between them all to make them all stand out from one another. Although they might have overdone it a little bit on the lighting in this game. While it is bright and colourful, it is also oftentimes a little too bright. The game really tends to overdo it on the sun glare and it can be more than a little distracting when it's at its very worst. As for the characters, well you've got 5 characters unlocked from the start with one additional secret character to unlock. Don't ask me how you do this though because I have tried and failed and nowhere on the internet seems to have the answer. So there you go, that's a mystery one of you can solve. So the characters that we do have here, they don't really play any differently from one another. You pick a character, select from a variety of different boards, and then once you're in game, there's really no major difference outside of your stance and the automatic tricks that they pull off. So character choice is really just personal preference at the end of the day, but I do suppose the character models look nice at least, so there you go, that's something. Of course, we can't finish up without talking about the game's sound, and while the announcer voices and sound effects are suitably fun and arcadey, the game's music is really one of its biggest highlights. There were times while playing this game that I really thought this could have been music from a Jet Set Radio game. And if you know Jet Set Radio, you know that that is the highest praise one can bestow a game soundtrack. Although given the developer's rhythm game pedigree, I suppose the excellent soundtrack isn't too surprising. But regardless, if you like high tempo electronic music from Japan, this game's soundtrack is definitely worth checking out. Look, first trick wakeboarding, it's got a lot of problems from the visual and performance issues to the boring trick mode and overly simple gameplay, but honestly for what it is, I had a good time with it. Sometimes all a game needs to be is a quick 30-40 minutes of arcade fun, and if you can put up with the game's frame rate, I think you will definitely find that here. It's a shame that this game was made ground up for the PlayStation, because if this actually had an arcade version that ran at 60 frames per second, well it really could have been something cool. They really just should have made this for the Dreamcast instead. Imagine. So yeah, that's uh, Burst Trick Wakeboarding. Not a great game, but kind of a guilty pleasure. If you can pick it up cheap, why not give it a try? It is the only wakeboarding game on the PS1 anyway, so it's not like you can do much worse. And with our final game out of the way, it's time to bring a close to Volume 5. We got to experience a day in the life of a Japanese family, check out a more streamlined take on one of the PlayStation's most beloved series, and we tried out an arcade auto-scroller that happens to be disguised as a wakeboarding game. But before we finish up, we need to slot each of the games into one of four categories. Is the game a must-play? Is it something worth trying if you like the look of it? Is the game just kinda meh? Or is the game trash and not worth your time at all? Volume 5 sees Blast Radius and Burst Trick Wakeboarding making it into the tri-tier, with Incredible Crisis being only the second game to make it into must-play. Blast Radius is a really fun space combat sim, and it's certainly more accessible and beginner-friendly than some of the other options on the console. But compared to its Big Brother Colony Wars, the mission variety and combat just feel a little lacking, and can run out of steam before you see the end. But if you're a fan of space combat sims on the console, there is still a lot to like here, and this one should definitely be on your radar. Burst Trick Wakeboarding is an odd game, definitely not what I expected, but I enjoyed it for what it is. It definitely has some technical shortcomings and one not so great mode, but there is a simple and fun arcade game here with some great music that genre fans should likely get a kick out of. And last but not least, Incredible Crisis, and I said it before and I'll say it again, I think this is a game that every PlayStation fan should play at least once. 
It is a very short game with very little replayability, but from start to finish, it is one of the most outlandish and enjoyable experiences on the PlayStation. Not every minigame is a winner, but they are all quick and wild enough to never lose your interest. If you are a fan of creative video games, Incredible Crisis is absolutely one of the most memorable on the console and is in my opinion a must try that should not be missed. Well, now you know my opinion, but more importantly, I'd like to know yours. Have you played any of these games before? Are there any games you'd like to see show up on the series? Let me know in the comments section below and if I missed any interesting games, I'll make sure to get them added to the list. As always, I'd like to say a big thank you for joining me here today. If you enjoyed the video, a like and subscribe is always greatly appreciated. You can also check out previous volumes and plenty more PS1 content over on the channel. But in the meantime, thanks again for joining me. I hope you're keeping happy and I hope you're keeping safe. And until next time, love you all and don't forget to praise the wheel. <laughs>